1492 was the start of a new age when Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas, then it was also the end of another age, an age where natives of this land did not die from a new disease or a new colonial oppressor. More importantly, how did the most powerful of these civilizations, that being the Aztecs and Inca, fall so quickly to just a handful of conquistadors? Disease, guns, and those who allied with the conquistadors were all in their enemies' favor. Experience was also in their favor. Not only had they just got done conquering a large portion of the Caribbean Sea Islands, but they had also just finished conquering another island chain, this one being much closer to Africa, and still part of Spain to this very day. Just off the Atlantic coast of West Morocco, there lies an archipelago of seven islands. They are called the Canary Islands, and on their shores, a new conqueror of nearly 12% of the landmass on Earth would emerge. This was the conquistadors' first conquest of an ancient civilization. They were called the Guanche, and outside of a few DNA scraps, none of them remain today. This is the birth of the conquistador and the death of the Guanche, the conquest of the Canary Islands. The first inkling of Spanish interest in the Canary Islands came from the Kingdom of Aragon. Merchants, missionaries, and adventurers all set out from the coast of the Iberian Peninsula, all after one or a combination of gold, glory, or God. They sought out to trade, convert, and enslave the local populations on the islands, a Berber-descended people originally from North Africa, whom they called the Guanche. Their cultures differed on each island, but many of their languages, especially those on the island of Tenerife, had a whistling aspect to them. The first mention of these islands comes to us from Pliny the Elder. He tells us of an expedition prompted by the Roman puppet king of Mauritania in the closing days of BC. This king's name was Juba II, husband of Cleopatra's daughter. The expedition sent out by Juba II found no humans on the islands although the explorers did find traces of human activity. On one of the islands was a large stone man-made temple-like structure, likely a pyramid like this one found on the largest of the islands, that being, again, Tenerife. But the adventurers did find man's best friend, the dog. The wild dogs on these islands were so numerous and so ferocious that King Juba II ended up naming the whole archipelago after them, the Canary Islands, or, when translated, Islands of the Dogs. Periodic visits to the islands by Roman merchants would follow. This time, they would find humans to trade with. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, and the settlement of North Africa by the Vandals, as well as the Iberian Peninsula by the Visigoths, the Canary Islanders were largely left isolated from the rest of the world. The Guanche could not trade with the outside world, as they had no knowledge of sail technology or large shipbuilding. Which naturally leads the question of, how did the Guanche arrive on the Canary Islands in the first place? That will likely remain a mystery until more research can be done on the early habitation of the Canaries. Contact with North Africa and the Iberian Peninsula only returned after the Arab conquests. Muslim merchants then re-established trade with local populations, these trading missions would sporadically continue. Contact with European sailors would only occur in 1312. Unsurprisingly, and like Christopher Columbus, this expedition was captained by a Genoan-born man. His name was Lancelotto Malocello. Lancelotto was in search of two other Genoese explorers who had disappeared off the coast of Northwest Africa. These two Genoese brothers, called the Vivaldi brothers, also like Christopher Columbus, were venturing west into the Atlantic in search of a new route to India. Unlike Christopher Columbus, the Vivaldi brothers were never heard from again, likely falling victim to the stormy Atlantic Ocean. Lancelotto Malicello knew of only one place where the brothers could have made an emergency landing. So in 1312, he and his crew set out from Genoa, sailing past the Pillars of Hercules until finally reaching one of the Canary Islands. The island that he landed on would be named after himself, being called Lanzarote from here on out. The indigenous name for the island was Titaragoka, 
He questioned the locals the best that he could, continuing his search for the Vivaldi brothers. None of the indigenous population had seen any trace of the brothers, however. Lancelotto had failed. The Vivaldi were lost. But so was he. Lanzarote must have been an island paradise for Lancelotto and his crew. The Genoese adventurer decided to stay for a time. And for a time, I mean 20 years. He constructed a small fort in the northwestern section of the island, and with the blessing of the local ruler of the island, he had a mostly friendly relationship with the Guanche. The island king of the Guanche was named Zonzamas. Zonzamas and Lancelotto would enjoy a peaceful coexistence, but soon enough, the king would die. He was succeeded by his daughter, Aiko, and her husband, Goranamon. They would prove to be far less friendly. Or perhaps it was the crew of Lancelotto who was the ones causing trouble. We simply don't know, as details of this so-called Guanche Revolt were never discussed in length. It did occur in 1332, as Lancelotto returned to the mainland in that same year. He would become the first of many Europeans that would settle on these islands. Whatever kind of revolt happened on Lanzarote Island did not affect Lancelotto Malicello. He would return to the island in 1336, this time under the sponsorship of the Crown of Portugal. This, however, seemed to be a failed expedition. By 1339, Lanzarote started to appear in Portuguese and European maps, drawing the attention of further exploration by the Portuguese crown. Another Genoese captain was hired, as well as another Italian, this one being from the city of Florence. Then a Portuguese captain joined the two hired captains in a three-ship expedition to map the islands fully. And they did a pretty good job as well, accurately counting seven large and inhabited islands and six much smaller islands. This concrete mapping of an archipelago inhabited by a pre-Bronze Age civilization started to draw the attention of other sailors. Sailors intent on raiding the Canary Islands, taking the goods of the islanders and the Guanche themselves. A year after the Portuguese mapping expedition in 1342, the King of Majorca sent two raiding parties to the islands, devastating the Guanche communities that they found there. Majorca was the largest of the Balearic Islands. The king of this archipelago was named James III. All raids in 1342 were highly profitable. Others, however, saw the Stone Age Guanche as something more than slaves. Although they extorted them in the process, missionary expeditions in hope of conversion were sent from the papacy. A man named Louis de Lacerda was given permission from the Avignon Pope. If you didn't know, for a while, Popes resided in Avignon, France, instead of the Vatican. Louis de Lacerda was a Spanish-born French noble. This was an attempt at a French conquest of the Canaries, although with the backing of the Pope. The conquests were being presented in the same way as a crusade, with forgiveness of sins being dished out by the church. When the kings of Portugal and Castile heard of the news, they both protested and claimed the islands for themselves by right of discovery. The papacy resisted sending an expedition to these islands due to these prior claims. Louis de Lacerda was still named as Prince of the Islands, however, by the Pope. When he died in 1348, the race to conquer the Canaries was resumed. The Kingdom of Majorca was notably out of the picture, and they had been since 1344. Aragon, a kingdom in the northeast of the Iberian Peninsula, conquered the Balearic Islands in that same year. The King of Majorca would return to his island with an army in 1349, but he would be killed while trying to reconquer the island of Majorca. The Aragonese crown was now in possession of sailors that had ventured to the Canary Islands many times. Trading and slaving parties were sponsored and sent out by Aragon. Soon the Pope would even return, this time with the hired help of two sailors from Majorca. He once again looked to convert the Guanche. On the island known as Gran Canaria, a missionary was constructed. With this missionary force also came back 12 Guanche who were enslaved and converted to Christianity. They would act as interpreters and examples for their fellow islanders to follow. The missionary was built and conversions slowly trickled in. However, many of the Guanche saw this new religion as a threat. In 1354, after three years, the missionary would be destroyed by the islanders. 
the islands were largely left to their own devices. Although Portuguese, Castilian, and Aragonese trading and raiding expeditions continued. In 1366, the King of Aragon, Peter IV, sent an expedition to the islands. He did this in order to see if any other European settlements had appeared on the islands. Missionary trips supported by Aragon began in the years following this expedition. Over the next three years, the church would send preachers to the islands. The rest of the Iberian Peninsula, besides Aragon, who again supported the Pope, continued seeing the Canaries as a land of periodic trade and slave runs. However, in 1370, King Ferdinand of Portugal granted two of the islands to a man thought to either be the son of Lancelotto Malicello or a very elderly Lancelotto Malicello himself. This granting of the island coincided with a brief Portuguese-Castilian war that would last from 1369 to 1370. Regardless of who it may be, the islands granted to this Lancelotto were Lanzarote and Logomera. A conquest of these islands was attempted, but could never gain a stable foothold. These were, however, the first Portuguese conquistadors. On one of these two islands in 1376, this Lancelotto-led expedition encountered the Guanche and their new ally, Castile. Castilian interest and involvement would only grow over the next decades alongside Portugal. This Lancelotto, either the son of the original one or the near 100-year-old original Lancelotto Malicello, would die in 1385. With his absence, the Portuguese foothold on the islands slowly slipped away after his death. Castilian interest slowly began to fill that gap. In 1390, a lord in southern Castile prepared an army and with the permission of King Henry III, set out on a raiding party to Lanzarote. This was likely the largest raiding party yet, five ships crewed by sailors and warriors. They found great success, apparently capturing 170 guanche and a horde of skins and rare wood and dyes. King Henry III was intrigued by this. It showed him that if Castile really used their resources, then they could conquer the islands. In 1402, Henry III had found the man for the job. He would become the first successful Castilian and later Spanish conquistador. He would also come to hold the title King of the Canary Islands. His name was Jean de Bethencourt, and he set sail on May 1st of 1402. The conquest of the Canary Islands has now truly began.